Now for just a few housekeeping notes before we start, you are most welcome to leave your cameras on, but please keep your mics muted while the forum is ongoing. There will be a Q&A session after the talk, so please feel free to post your questions in the chat at any time. After posting your question in the chat, you may be invited to unmute yourself and read it out during the Q&A session if you are comfortable doing so. Also, this webinar will be recorded and posted online. Today, we are very honored to welcome Dr. Joanna Lay as our special guest. Dr. Lay began her professional career as a policy researcher at the University of Pennsylvania in 1984. She joined the New York media conglomerate, Capital Cities ABC, in 1987 as a research editor. In 1997, she was recruited to join a BCEA fund in Singapore, covering all of Asia, excluding Japan. During the Asian financial crisis, she was appointed chairperson of BCEA Taipei, running the Taiwan portfolio. Between 2002 and 2008, Dr. Lei was active in policy and political discussions in Taiwan and cross-strait arenas. <coughs> As a KMT legislator and deputy party whip in the legislative union, she had chaired the Organic Laws and Statutes Committee. <coughs> now, we are also pleased to welcome back our familiar panel of experienced co-moderators. Professor Da Feng is the Honorary Dean of Hainan University Belt and Road Research Institute and the Chief Advisor of the China Silk Road I Valley Research Institute. Next, Professor Zichun Zhu is the Chair of the International Relations Department at Bucknell University, USA. He is also a member of the National Committee on United States-China Relations. Finally, we have Professor Stephen Pei, affiliated with the University of Houston, where he is a semiconductor and nanotechnology scientist, as well as an electrical engineering professor. These four distinguished speakers will engage in discussion today and reply to your questions during the Q&A session. Now, without further ado, I shall hand the time over to Prof Pei to kick off the discussion. Thank you. Prof Pei, please. You're unmuted, Stephen. Oh, sorry. Hi, Joanne. Welcome. Nice to meet you again virtually. Uh, I think that it's very nice to have you to speak to the whole world today about the problem in the Taiwan Strait. Um, in particular, most recently, I came across two surveys. The first survey is conducted by CSIS in the US. That's a major think tank in the US. And basically what they have done is they interviewed 64 leading experts in the, in the US, in the China study area, who are experts about People's Republic of China, Taiwan, the cross Strait situation. Half of them were former democratic officers. The other half are former Republican officers. And the survey shows 83% of them believe that Beijing would not apply military forces to Taiwan before 2027. So that means that we, we are not in any immediate dangers to have any war happening in Taiwan. On the other hand, in Taiwan, the United Daily News conducted a survey recently, just less than 10 days ago, to hope the people in Taiwan, how they respond to pronounces our congressional speaker's visit to Taiwan. And the 44% is against it, and the only 35% support it. So the majority of the people do not feel the pronounces visit to Taiwan is helping the situation of the cross strait tension. So would you please take away and tell us what is your observation from Taiwan? Well, thank you, Stephen, for a great introduction. All of the above questions actually cannot be answered in a vacuum. Recently, there is another survey that says, should Taiwan declare independence? 70 over percent of the people believe that PRC will attack Taiwan within six months. 
that just simply tells us that everything has preconditions or boundary conditions when we look at surveys like this. Let me um, first thank the great introduction of, um, sorry, um, I wanna make sure that, can you guys see me? Can you guys see the sharing? Not, Hello? not yet, not yet. Okay, let me start, stop this and then go back to see if I can share. The, oh, hi, 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 sorry. It takes a minute to get this done. <clears throat> I don't know what happened because it was in a very nice position. Um, let me first thank Da Xuan for inviting me to give a talk. And when we started talking about this topic, it was way back when, when war was not a immediate possibility and the situation hasn't deteriorated to today's state. But from <laughs> that point to today, we have actually changed quite a lot. So um, let me make sure that I can share. Ah, here it comes, here it comes. Um, can you see the, um, see my slide? Not yet. You cannot see my slide. Okay, let me see. It's coming, it's coming. It's, it's coming. It must it's be here. coming. It's not good to be coming. <laughs> it has to be here. <laughs> I am in trouble. Ay, ay, ay. If not, can I ask our moderator to help? Yeah. We actually tried it earlier. Yes, we will share uh, Dr. Lei's screen. Maybe just give us a moment. Okay, now can you see it? Ah, okay, got it. Okay, perfect. Ah, very good. Okay, when we started talking about this, um, to war or not to war was, was merely a rhetoric. You know, you, you guys all know I copied Hamlet and talk about maybe we have a choice and maybe we need to make a choice. But now it seems to be more imminent a question than when we started it. And what happened? August 2nd, Pelosi visit happened. So I'm going to start by opening um, overview of what happened since August 2nd, because I think it's a major turning point. Then I talked about the two options, to war, why, why now, and not to war, how not to. This is an alternative to our path to future and probably closing with some parting thoughts, which is meant to stimulate some discussions and debate um, of all. Let's start with a very quick overview of the Pelosi visit. And I called it a quake because it's an epicenter and changed everything. And plus it has quite a few of Aftermath, when Pelosi visited Taiwan, the events leading to it actually were unprecedented. And we probably don't have time to go, to go through it play by play, but there were unprecedented events prior to her visit. And during her visit, there were a lot of debates and discussions on what all three parties, three, PRC, Taiwan, and the United States would react to it. But what's really, really clear is the equilibrium that were established for over 40, 50, 60 years in the West Pacific were broken at that moment with immediate reactions and ensuing enduring consequences. A, a couple of major ones is immediate major military operation around Taiwan by People's Liberation Army. PRC issued a white paper, the third white paper on Taiwan resolution, the resolution of the Taiwan issue. And following that in the 77th United Nations General Assembly, there were a lot of discussions about Taiwan and about cross trade and potential um, opening or possibility of a war. Then there were congressional activities, Taiwan Policy Act, and a most recent September 21st proposed the accelerating arms transfer to Taiwan Act. All of this happened within a very short period of time. And it's you know, one aftermath after another in the whole equilibrium or what we usually call the status quo were shaken. And I believe that there were a lot of other things to come after the 20th party Congress in PRC. I'm selecting two charts that I think tell the story really clearly. On the left side was done by the 
China News Agency, which is Taiwan's official news agency, it uh, clearly marked that the old median line of the Taiwan Strait this time were clearly violated, broken, or ignored. Then it clearly marked the areas in which the territorial waters that within 12 nautical miles were violated by the military operation in PRC and the path of all the long range missiles. That's the left side. It clearly stated from August 4th to August 7th, Taiwan was surrounded by major military action and things actually went from between mainland China and Taiwan to the east side of Taiwan. So the whole area denial or anti-access line for PRC moved from the middle of the Taiwan Strait to the east side of Taiwan Strait. It's a major change of the geopolitical balance. And the second chart is also important, also reported by Taiwan's official news agency, Focus Taiwan. This is a chart by Japan. Japan claimed that it's EEZ exclusive economic zone, this blue line, um, sorry, were violated by some of the missiles. If you could see that the path to area five to or the missiles five to nine pass through the blue line. But it is important to know that this particular dot that I'm pointing is called Yanu, um, Yagununi Shima. This Yagununi Shima is a new addition to the EEZ. The EEZ used to be a straight line from here all the way down. Japan moved it 200 uh, kilometer west to include the entire island. And that's the area where they claim that they're easy or violated. Okay, so this is a thumbnail sketch of the military action immediately after that. And I'm writing a couple of things for you to, um, to use as a sort of footnote. It's unprecedented in terms of proximity weapons demonstrated and troops mobilized. And it broke all de facto lines of control, extended the area of area denial and anti, area denial and anti-access. And it's showing force, not just to Taiwan, but primarily to the United States and Japan. And not surprisingly, there will be response by United States and Japan, the two important players in the region. So I wrote, quasi response by the USSN because it's not really show of force. It's more like, oh, I'm not, I'm not scared of you. And that's the chart following that. On August 28th, two ships passed through the Taiwan Straits. And based on the Seventh Fleet website, you can see that they demonstrated that they are fearless. They went through the Taiwan Strait. They are not afraid of PRC. And one sailors actually demonstrated uh, the inside of the ship. And I think this chart is, uh, this photo is particularly important. If you see um, all the lines in this major Marine force by the United States, you could actually see it was built probably 40 years ago. And the major forces in the US Navy are 40 years old or some are slightly younger but they were built at a time when the war was fought in a different way. But in addition to that, so this is the first Taiwan Strait, I'm not afraid of you, you know, I passed through it. But following that, US um, ships went back to South Korea, they went back to South China Sea. All of these you can easily find in South China Sea probing initiative, which was um, an initiative done by the Beijing University, they tracked all the military actions and civilian actions like fishing boats in the entire area. Okay, now, in addition to the military show, show of force, it's not really a pissing match, but it's like show of force. I'm not afraid of you. The United States Congress and the 77th UN General Assembly once again had a lot of discussion on the, the one China issue. But generally you can see there is a gradual shift from the old regime such as the UN resolution 2758, um, that was in the early 70s, US-China joint communiques 
that were in the middle to end late 70s, Taiwan Relations Act 1979, those are the old regime to a new regime. The new regime is generally turned by US officials as one China policy, and they insisted that their one China policy has not changed, did not change, and are not changing. But in addition to that, there are proposals like Taiwan Policy Act and Accelerating Arms Transfers to Taiwan Act and more to come. The Taiwan Policy Act actually revamped the entire foundation of the old One China Principle, the Accelerating Arms Transfer Act to Taiwan Act, I'm putting it on the next page, has three really scary um, um, proposals. And I copied um, and pasted the website so that you know that I didn't make it up. It's real and it's done by American politicians. And it says, it make Taiwan eligible to prior to delivery of access defense articles, fine. Require the Secretary of Defense to use the Special Defense Acquisition Fund to accelerate weapons procurement for Taiwan, okay? But the last one, take a closer look. Authorize the creation of a war stockpile. So, so if, if you look carefully, then there could be a war stockpile in Taiwan. What would that mean? A reserve stockpile on Taiwan, reserve for whom? For what purposes? What type of reserve? What kind of stockpile? I think if you recall the Cuban crisis, when Soviet Union, the USSR, try to put missiles on Cuba. How United States reacted to that Cuban crisis would be exactly the way PRC would react should United States decided to put a war reserve stockpile on Taiwan. So all of these are happening. We are not imagining a war on Taiwan. It is really happening. Um, the next page, sorry, there is something that I should... Uh, and there are other sidebar activities by other politicians. For example, today, Michael Pompeo is still in Taiwan. He came on July, uh, September 26th, two days ago. He came um, for a business forum, but in that forum, he made extremely clear statements on the status of Taiwan citing her position as the former Secretary of State. And he said he was the one of the most um, supported, he was uh, the most uh, supportive friend of Taiwan. But his view on Taiwan is, Taiwan is, um, he used our official name, that's the Republic of China. It's de facto independent. Therefore, there's no need for Taiwan to declare independence. And it says, Taiwan is in the forefront of freedom. Against what? And then it says Taiwan is a free and democratic country. Vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, he didn't say the other part, which is not free and not democratic. And Taiwan is an ally vis-a-vis -vis the other part that's not an ally. So if we look at what happened since August 2nd, in such a short period of time, there were major aftermath in international arena in Washington, DC, and also in our region around where we are. Let me ask a simple question. When they say US has not changed, the one China policy did not change, has not changed, what did it really mean? There were two major terms being used here. One is the one China principle, China used that. And the other one is one China policy, United States is using that. Are they merely differences of narratives? Are they just simply splitting hair? No, not really. Let me try to put it more succinctly. In the left side, you can see I use Beijing, Washington DC and Taipei as um, the three different positions. Beijing's one China principle, DC's currently used one China policy and Taipei under DPP government is claiming one China, one Taiwan, or sometimes they call it two countries, are similar in the first part. They all claim that there is all, only one China in the world. One China is their commonality. But the second part, 
you separate them by far. The Beijing position, so was the Republic of China's constitutional position was there is only one China, both mainland China and Taiwan belong to that one China. So the Beijing's position is that one China include Taiwan. The DC position is gradually shifting to may or maybe not. And the Taiwan DPP current regime's position is does not include Taiwan. So if you take the three, um, if you split the three from the get-go and you push it to the end, the final solution, the resolution at the end, what happens to the end will be very, very different. They're diverging. If you believe there's only one China, then you only have a question of whether it's a peaceful or forced unification of that one China. If you believe that, oh, Taiwan may or may not belong to that China, include Taiwan. In the past, the United States took a non-interventionary position, which was expressed in the three communique in Taiwan Relations Act. In more recent months, more recent years, um, especially by John Kirby recently, he said, okay, we're taking a double deterrence position. We're telling mainland China not to wage force against Taiwan, and we're, taking ta we're telling Taiwan not to claim independence. But gradually, if you see what's the congressional actions and the actions in UN, they are increasingly interventionary. Finally, on the Taiwan side, if you believe that one China does not include Taiwan, then simple question would be whether you would accept the status quo, which is a de facto independence by the Republic of China, or you will try to move it further by using referendum or other means or have a new constitution to achieve de jure independence. So while there is a um, very small difference in language and sometimes it's intentionally ambiguous, the one China principle used by PRC is extremely different by the one China policy currently used by the, the United States. And that is the crux of the potential of war. Let me go through a longer term perspective. To war or not to war, I think nobody in his or her same mind would say, okay, let's go into war. But why are we looking at this? Let me bring everyone back to Asia Pacific over the seven decades, especially on the cross-strait relations. This is a simple chronology. In 1949, when the KMT government first came to Taiwan, fled from mainland China, defeated, to 1958, it was the time of hot war. The final battle is the bombardment of Kui Moi in 1958 from August 23rd, which just passed, to October 5th. Then there were a period of long hiatus. Wars were happening in other places, Indochina in, in particular, such as in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Laos. And by the way, I, forget to, I forgot to mention the Korean War in the first hot war area. And actually it was during the Korean War, the United States decided to accept Taiwan, the KMT government as its ally once again. Starting from 1972 to 93, there were gradual shift of the wind. So there were switching recognition in the United Nations and changing of diplomatic ties by the United States, severing from the Republic of China, which is in Taiwan, and establishing a tie with the PRC, which is in mainland. So that was a gradual shift. The next three area, the next two areas were the shift of Taiwan. From 1993 to 2000, Li Denghui as the president has gradually proposed a re-entering of the United Nations as Taiwan. And that's when PRC issued the first Taiwan white paper. In 2000, DPP defeated KMT and gained the presidency. It became the first regime. And that was the time when PRC issued the second white paper. And on the next period of time, which was really interesting, and I was a part of that, from 2005 when Lian Zhan went to China, 
opening up direct dialogue between the KMT and Communist Party in China, there were a period of time when, when the officials across Taiwan Straits engaged in government-to-government -government negotiations, including ECFA, which is the economic framework, and over 30 agreements were inked on the official status. Prior to that, there were second track or third track negotiation, but there were government to government negotiations during 2008 and 2016. And that was a time when peace was a real possibility. From 2016 to present, the DPP regained the authority of the administration and PRC issued a third white paper after Pelosi's visit this year. And it was for the first time it waged extensive military option operations by PLA post Pelosi's visit. So if you look at my two red lines, the last time we had a hard war um, or warm war, because it was somewhat limited, it was 1958. From 1958 to 2022, there were no war. There were de facto recognition of line of control, there were people trying to reach some kind of a resolution. There were international changes, but there were no real threat of war. And that's really important to remember. We had a long, 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 long period of time when war was not a possibility, not even a remote possibility. And let me quickly go through the other two wheels that's in within this cross-strait relations, that's the United States and Japan. Um, many of you probably know Richard Bush, and he wrote a book called um, Two Tigers in One Mountain, and basically outlined the very important role of Japan. Now, let's take a look at post-World War II. Immediately after that, U.S. has embraced Japan as its primary ally in the Asia-Pacific, which is something that, if you think carefully, quite strange and unthinkable because Japan was the only country that actually attacked the United States in Hanumun. So after the World War II, the United States has decided to embrace Japan as its major partner. And I copied Project 2049 Institute's depiction of that relationship. And you all know Project 2049 was one of the primary think tank promoting the downfall of the uh, communist regime by 2049. And during that period of time, post-war period for the United States, Asia is a very important place for them to exercise the following strategies, containment. So they have joint defense treaties with Japan, with South Korea, and at the time, they also had it with the Republic of China, which is in Taiwan and in the Philippines. The second part was hub and spoke, thinking of a world of a wheel, that the United States is at a hub, and they have a lot of spoke with a bilateral relationship. And when you have all these bilateral relationships combined, it will be a wheel that can be very functional with the United States at the center. And that same idea was expressed in TPP in the current IPEF. From 1979, people like Nixon and Kissinger promoted an idea of linkage and leverage. They actually linked with China and to create leverages against USSR, which was their primary target. And from Obama era, you have uh, Obama and Hillary talking about return or repivot to Asia. But the return and repivot to Asia has a very important undertone. They said the Pacific is a very big place. And when they return, actually, they never left because the United States is in the east side of the Pacific. They are merely returning to the West Pacific. But what we're seeing, and most strangely, is from Trump's unilateralism to Biden's bowl in a glass shop approach, the new narrative in Washington, D.C., tour of Beijing is one of competition, confrontation, and most recently, strong hostility. Am I imagining? Well, 
let me put two charts first. The posturing of a Pacific war, if there were a Pacific war, it's most likely, th this is a, a chart in 2012, but the general idea hasn't changed. And I, I for the simplicity, I, I like this chart because it clearly outlined the current strategy. That is for the United States not to directly engage in any of the warfare on the first line. They are retreated to the second line of defense, which is Guam, Tianning, and Palau here. Okay. So this is the way they see Pacific. If they they if there were a potential warfare, China would threaten these countries, these pearl chain countries. And the United States will support these countries to wage whatever war against the aggressor, which is China. And the United States will support in a distance from Guam, Tianning, Palau. And this, this is the line of defense. And of course, the next line of defense is Hawaii and then back into San Diego. That particular idea of a potential war will have some prerequisites. For example, Taiwan has to have a very strong position of its sovereignty claim against PRC's would-be aggression. It also has a new strategy, which was proposed by the US Marine called EABO, Expeditionary Advanced Base Operation, meaning that they will put um, stockpiles war stockpiles in advanced bases to support the operation. And then another more recent strategy by US Navy is called anti-insurgency. They depicted all the actions by PRC in South China Sea as insurgency and US Navy will be the white knight waging anti-insurgency campaigns. If that were the case, based on the recent developments and strategic thinking, all the Nansai shuttle, which are these islands um, far, far away from Japan and at the southwest part of Ryukyu, the Okinawa, these islands could be the advanced bases for Americans' expeditionary advanced base operation. The island I told you and I outlined just now was Yunaguni Jima, which was in the last chart of the August 4th to 7th military action, where Japan claimed that its economic, exclusive economic zone was violated. It's, this is exactly that island. It's less than 200 kilometers from Taiwan. The other two islands are important. We saw them a lot of times. Ishigaki Island, Jima, Miyako Jima. Miyako Island has the longest uh, airfield, which is 3,000 meter, three kilometers long. So this is like unthinking um, airline carrier, Air Force carrier. Ishigaki Jima was used um, to demonstrate its ability to break the US blockade. So PRC has gone through areas from here to here or from here to here. They were very careful not to go through Yunaguni, Jima, and Taiwan. They didn't pass through this. All the PRC or P People's Liberation Army um, didn't go through this particular path. Okay. But this is what the United States was planning or preparing. What about Japan? Japan is the United States' longest, most strong ally, according to the US strategist. But US. Um, Japan also has its own dream. Japan used the US-Japan alliance after the war for their own reconstruction. Then they gradually went into global engagement. They were the country that invaded a lot of countries, but now they came back using peacekeeping operation, using official development aid, using multilateral organization contribution, such as to the United Nations to demonstrate its ability and its willingness to come back to the international society. Most recently, the important part was 
archipelago enlargement and arc of freedom and prosperity. These, these two are more recent. In terms of the archipelago enlargement was primarily after the 1980, after the new marine um, order were established and the arc of freedom and prosperity was primarily on the 21st century. Okay, I'm just using two charts. This is where Japan sees itself. If their archipelago enlargement were successful, including this island here, this is called Okinotori Reef. I think a lot of them, a lot of you might know this, I might be repeating, but for those who do not know, this islands closed the final loop. Without this island, you would have a, a person with two legs. It would not be closed, but this was not really an island. It was a coral reef. So Japan tried to use that to define its southeast border. And that was declined by United Nations CLCAS in July, 2012. And this other picture shows you how that it's not um, considered an island. An island must be above water even during high tide. So Japan elevated this island so that it's above water during high tide. And this artificial elevation was not recognized by UN. And the other part was very rarely seen. That is when Japan wants to build an East Asia community during the war that they waged against China and all these other places in Indochina, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, they, they claim that they'll build a community that will be prosperous by, for all and by all. And that idea is still carried to today. This is by Asahi Weekly in um, about 10 years ago. And I, I like it for its simplicity as well. So if you look at it from the, the Japan's perspective, you know, you would have a relationship with the India, with the Indochina Peninsula, with Indonesia, with Malaysia and all these other islands and then go coming back to Philippines, Taiwan and so on and so forth. So this is how the United States and China sees themselves as the primary force in Asia. Then why are we talking about upcoming war in Asia? Why now? Well, I think the most important reason is that China is now seen, especially by the United States as a threat. And that language has been used um, by a lot of people in different places. China becomes a perceived threat due mainly to three factors. Of course, there are others, but I think the three are the most primary. One is the speed to which it grew. The rapid growth in GDP and trade relations make it seem to be an unthinkable engine. Now China's GDP is over 75%, close to 80% of the US GDP. The United States has not faced a potential competitor this large. USSR was never this large, was about 77% of US GDP. But not only in its, its strength in the number, in the size of GDP and trade relations, but in the areas in which China is gaining leadership, such as in digital economy, in new energy solutions and industrial revolution 4.0, which is a 5G and IOA connected using international um, um, artificial intelligence connected manufacturing proposals. So all of these future arenas, China is gradually taking decisive leadership. The second part is, China seems to be having increasing and enlarging circles of friends. If you look at G7 and the United States and probably the old EU, you won't see this. But if you count all the resolutions or the decisions made in UN, in WHO, in the One Belt, One Road initiatives, recently in RCEP, in Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in BRICS, you can see that there were more and more people who were at, at least willing to go into a bipolar world in which one was dominated by the United States and its order, and the others has a more um, egalitarian or equitable relationships among all. 
And this was not seen in the Western media because in the Western media, China is the big bad wolf. It's leading all the partners into potential debt trap. But if you look closer inside, you could see that in all of these arenas, they seem to be um, following a different principles, the alternative global view challenging US dominated rule based order and purported universal values, because the United States continues to use democracy, freedom or liberty or human rights as the universal value and challenging PRC. Okay. Well, China is growing and it's very big, but it's not a threat. Why is this threat? I'm using a very old book, which is 2013, but the author didn't update his book. So I thought I still respect his authorship. Um, Daniel Alpert pointed out something really important. We entered into a world of oversupply after the dissolution of USSR. All the countries, you know, the resource countries, ex-USSR countries were not important at the time of 1995. They were very small. This, um, this line, this brown color line means its contribution to the global macroeconomic intersection. Okay, so they were very small. They are not that important. United States, Canada, and EU are very important. They are very big, and they experienced a very small deficit. So, you know, they are the primary force of the global economy. Japan is a major player. Its current account has a small surplus, so it's making money from the world and also selling goods to the world. And that was a very comfortable world if you are a United States leader, um, if you are in EU you are the G7 players. It's a very comfortable player uh, place for you to be because you decide on the distribution of values and you actually enjoy the toy and work of all the people from the rest of the world. 20, 2006 gave you a different story. And if we have a story of 2022, it will be far more different from this. But even in 2006, the world is no longer that comfortable if you stay on the US, Canada, and EU side. The world has new players coming in. They come in with new population, new DGP, GDP, new labor force. They come into the world and they are making money. Their current account has a surplus while the established economies has a larger deficit. So, this is the back, backdrop. The backdrop is a world of oversupply. And in that backdrop, present day China in the Washington DC, it's seen as the Godzilla, the big monster that's changing the current structure. If you see the languages used in DC or the languages used in the US um, entertainment, primetime shows or um, Netflix shows, you would see similar languages being reflected. But is that China's fault? I actually took a little girl to see this movie in when it first showed, I was in Singapore. In the middle of the show, the little girl cried. And she cried and I say, Alison, why did you cry? She said, she didn't do anything wrong. She's just too big. Think about it. If this was a little lizard, who would think of it as a monster? No, she was just too big. She was trying to eat enough food so that she can go to a safe place to lay her eggs so that her offsprings can be hatched. And Alison said her only crime was she was too big. Doesn't that sound very familiar? Isn't China simply too big right now? It didn't do anything to threaten anybody, especially in the military or diplomatic front. It didn't do anything to threaten anybody. So let me take a look at, if you were an American leader and you're trying to see how you can move forward, if you were to look at how you compete and where you decide and where you choose, um, I, drafted this chart uh, a while back about 2012,
because I think it's important to conceptualize how much freedom you have in deciding on where you fight. And this is these four quadrants are determined by military might on one side and economic strength on the other side. The more military power you have, the more likely you can use diplomacy and military force. The more economic strength you have, the more likely you can use finance and trade as your primary theater of confrontation. Then let me use this concept to examine United States and PRC in the current time. These are just select strengths. If you look at the United States, it wanted to maintain its supremacy and hegemony. It says, build back better America first. So it has to go back to its supremacy and hegemony. And what it has in his hand would be strong control over the worldwide financial systems. IMF, World Bank, were the old Brenton Wood system, we all understand. But also we now gradually see the power of FedWire, which is between Fed Reserve and other central banks, CHIPS, which is the clearinghouse in the uh, commercial sense between commercial banks and SWIFT, which is used by um, Biden to the Russia situation and everybody now understand what SWIFT is about. It also still has a great dominance in worldwide capital markets, not just the United States, but worldwide capital markets moved along with the US capital markets. It dominates global military arena. It's a dominant global military power. Its military budget is the, the, the sum of the next 10 countries combined. And it's the leadership in science and technology. Many of our listeners on the screen or currently joining us are the leaders in science and technological research. Looking at PRC, which is seen as a threat to the United States. It's strong. It has a strength in manufacturing. It's critical in global supply chain. It's dominant in new infrastructure. So all three make it a formidable big competitor. Its strength in trade and trade relations are increasing by the moment. It accelerated its military build out in recent years, and it accelerated its development in science and technology, not only in advanced technologies, but in new frontiers and in basic research. All of these make it a increasingly formidable enemy or competitor. So if you were the United States, why, why now? It's a simple question and it has a very simple answer because your competitor will get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. So when war, however limited, is seen as an optimal solution, then the question, then the question becomes when and where based on the strategic and military posturing of the entire area. I listed a lot of countries here, and I think you can all see that they all play different roles if you are from Washington DC looking at a map in Asia Pacific. But the most important part will be Taiwan, which is the political confrontation and asymmetrical warfare center, the nucleus of nucleus. It is the nucleus because it is the most important critical interest. It is the interest of the, the PRC and it is the interest for them not to wage in any way, shape or form. It's the critical interest. So if you were to start a war, if you move India, you move Singapore, China may or may not react to you, but if you move Taiwan, China will react. And that is as simple, as plain as we are seeing in the last two months. Okay, quickly, do we have an alternative path to future which is not to war? Because there seem to be an increasing pressure pushing us to war. Actually, China has proposed it. It can be a dawning era for all developed, developing and underdeveloped economies because there is a new growth proposal. This growth proposal will resolve the problem of the oversupply, which I outlined earlier, by building up those new economies and opening up different markets. So you have an enlarged pie. It will also resolve global challenges, 
such as climate change, pandemic, natural disasters, by developing new technologies and implementing new solutions together. And it promotes equality in a new rule-based order. Rule-based order is used by the United States all the time, but this new rule-based order is equal. Egality is a principle with a fair and equitable pricing and value distribution system. The old value and pricing system was that the top value added players, which is primarily US and G7 and EU, they will have the lion's share of the value. The manufacturers and the resource providers have the small little meager share of the value. Okay, now are we talking about dreams or is it possible? My answer is it is not only possible, it has always been and it's now going on. I put a, a chart, which is a Ming Dynasty chart that everybody knows is when Zheng He went through all these places and built economic and trade relationship. See, we could do it. It's an alternative view on international relations, which is through trade and you build value adds and you have a symbiotic relationship across all. I'm adding another chart, which is Financial Times view on the one built one road, which is slightly different from your opening chart, because I think this does show a different perspective. And I'm not criticizing this chart, but I'm saying it is a different perspective. If I were to criticize it, I would put a colony chart on how the European countries have colonized Asia. And that would be a criticism. But this is a different view of the one built one road which is a lead into the next chart. Unfortunately, this is just in China, Chinese, but um, let me explain what it is. It is conceiving one built, one road as different economic built or economic corridors. It's giving each and every circle, each and every economic corridor its definition in a new world where everybody can go through trade and relationship to have their own hopes and dreams realized. So you would have European route, Central Asia, West Asia route, Southeast Asia, Indochina, South Asia route. And then you also have another route going to South Pacific, the Blue Pacific. So, so this is how China, when they first proposed one belt, one road, it's not just a linkage, of old infrastructure such as roads and um, super highways and, and, and um, uh, high speed railroads, but also a overall development of areas and corridors so that they would have their self propelled growth and their own hopes and dreams. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to say is, this alternative path is not only possible, but also a must win race. I don't see it as a boxing match that people have to punch each other. It is a race of different way to look at the future. One is, um, one is of dominance and distribution. The other is of win-win and enlargement of economic pies. When, they, when people choose to cooperate and re, we, when they resist it and dual foreign intervention, pushing them into confrontation, when they resolve their differences with bilateral and multilateral engagements, all of the above can be achieved and the race will be won. Okay, are we doing it? Yes, indeed. I'm going to go through a couple of charts to let you know that what we're doing. This is a anal analysis done in late August. But this, I think, is very telling, you know, for everybody who says South China Sea and the nine dash lines are threats to sovereignty. China, Indonesia and Malaysia has a very creative way to resolve the issue. When China claimed the nine dash lines and the exclusive economic zones overlapped, when Indonesia started developing oil drills in Natuna, and Malaysia started drilling here. What they have done was to say, okay, you can have your claim. And China say it did not claim the sovereignty over these islands. And they all decided 
that they will go through oil drill as usual. Kasawari gas continued to develop. The Indonesians said, and I learned this word, they have a strategy called jagan bikang gadu, meaning that they will just put things as is. If your ship will come, fine, let it come. But we will continue to drill. And this is a beautiful dance of walls from Asians' um, mentality and our own ability to resolve the issue. And then we are also doing massive trades among ourselves. RCEP is already the largest trading block. BRICS is now enlarging with increasing importance. They're trying to resolve major issues going forward. And Shanghai Cooperation Organization adding an economic dimension this year. So you can see all these are trying to move in a different way, a different future from a determined war, which would destroy everything. So let me end with a couple of charts for you. We all know Thucydides' trap, but I think it's just a warning, not a self-fulfilling prophecy, unless we forced it. Is China too big? It depends. Because United States was the biggest country in the world in the past. Was it seen as the Godzilla? By some country maybe, but generally not. It was seen as where dreams can come true and lots of people have their dreams realized. So it is fear, not size, that decides on the future, on how each other are treated. If you are driven by fear, then you could go into wrong judgment, wrong preemptive strike, and then in turn, which may lead to cat catastrophe. So I put the Statue of Liberty here. I lived in New York for 10 years. If this was the American past, and it called a lot of people to the United States to realize their American dreams. What will and should define the China yet to come? There are a lot of things we can work together. The most important part is to prevent us from going into the destruction of war. I think 2022 is really a year of humanity at a crossroad. At the beginning of the year, I wouldn't say so, but now we already have the Ukrainian war and we have a lot of discussions of a potential Taiwan war. We, the stakeholders, must find the wisdom and our courage to respond to a call which does not bring all of us into a potential disaster, a catastrophe, which can even be a nuclear destruction. And that call is ours to respond. Seven decades after World War II, I went to Bandung in Indonesia, looking at its original idea of how a world can be developed. At that time, there was no strong economic power for the Asian and African non-affiliated countries. In 2009, the United States asked the other countries to help bringing in a new beginning. 2013, China proposed a new global view, one built, one road, and 2022, it's like a whiplash. We went back to a discussion of to war or not to war. The choice is ours and the time to act is now. Ladies and gentlemen, I opened by a soliloquy of to war or not to war by Hamlet. I thought I would end with another soliloquy by Tennyson. Ulysses, it says, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the bath of all the Western stars until I die we should all to strike, to seek, to find, and not to yield. No matter how difficult the situation might be, peacemakers together, we should strive, seek, find, and never to yield. Thank you, and give the time back to Dashian. Thank you very much for this uh, breathtaking uh, uh, discussion of an issue that is so deeply worrying for everyone. Um, again, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to glimpse into a perspective that one does not hear easily. Uh, I would like to first ask my good friend Zhu Ziqing to make some comments. Zhu, uh, go ahead. 
thank you, uh, Dashuan. Thank you so much, Dr. Lei. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. I really uh, learned a lot. Uh, it's uh, such a comprehensive and insightful analysis of this difficult issue surrounding Taiwan's uh, security and Taiwan's future. And I share your conclusion that uh, we should pursue an alternative path of no war, you know. Um, and I really admire your, uh, you know, application of, of uh, these uh, poems uh, into uh, these uh, difficult geopolitical issues. You know? uh, however, you know, I'm not that um, optimistic, actually. Uh, so I know uh, uh, a lot of people here have uh, may have uh, questions uh, to raise. So I will be very brief and um, I, I will just... Uh, throw out uh, some uh, questions uh, for, for, for you, Dr. Lei, and for maybe for uh, everybody else also to consider. Um, maybe three or four question or points. Uh, number one, you said, you know, the, uh, the three parties um, totally disagree you know, with each other on the definition of one China. Um, I mean, we understand, you know, one China is, is at the core, at the center of the dispute, really, uh, across the strait and between China and the United States. So if, if uh, all three parties have such a contrasting definition of one China, um, it seems to me the conflict um, is, is irreconcilable, uh, which means the, the, the confrontation or even war will be inevitable, right? So that's my first comment or slash question for you. Uh, how, how do we reconcile this uh, contrasting definition of one China, uh, which is really uh, uh, the, 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 the cause, the root cause of all the problems we have now, right? Um, second point, second question is, you know, uh, I think we all remember this uh, economist uh, cover page, which says that Taiwan is the most dangerous place on earth, right? last year or May last year. Um, so what is interesting or what, what puzzles me is that, you know, uh, the, the situation in Taiwan or in the Taiwan Strait is very serious, viewed from outside, right? People outside Taiwan are really concerned <laughs> about the security, future of democracy in Taiwan. Um, but it seems to me that people inside Taiwan do not feel that way. I mean, even with the PRC, uh, you know, military exercise going on around Taiwan, well, life is as usual in Taiwan, you know. So I want to you know what explains this uh, puzzling discrim uh, this discrepancy, you know. Uh, on the one hand, you know, outside Taiwan, people are so concerned, but inside Taiwan, life as usual, right? Uh, my third point or uh, question is, you know, um, I think. Uh, 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 Steve Pei, Professor Pei also mentioned this at the beginning, uh, those uh, new surveys showing that uh, uh, increasingly people in Taiwan view foreign intervention and uh, visits by foreign officials and uh, members of foreign uh, legislation to Taiwan as uh, some of the top top reasons why you know people in Taiwan are concerned about conflict, right? Uh, so if that's the case, then I I I would assume that uh, some people or some political party, especially political parties uh, in opposition, should uh, work um, against this idea of you know uh, inviting foreigners, especially United States, right, to try to help or defend defend Taiwan. Uh, I mean, you have uh, this this Pelosi visit, uh, but but of course you know Taiwan um, Policy Act is is the most provocative so far. Well, it has not passed yet, but uh, uh, potentially it's 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 going to be very damaging to the relationship. So my puzzle again is, you know, given the situation, why uh, there has not been enough uh, pushback inside Taiwan if if such things are dangerous for people in Taiwan? Um, why the the no, I mean, the DPP, of course, you know, will work with the United States, whatever, right? But I wonder why opposition parties, especially KMT and Coenges, TPP, and why they have not used these so-called checks and balances to try to introduce some moderation or to try to help mitigate the tensions 
Uh, so that's again, that's another puzzle for me, right? Yeah. Uh, I know time is uh, limited, right? One more question, maybe, you know. Okay, so um, you mentioned the U United Nations, you mentioned the uh, resolution 2758. Um, and of course, the PRC's understanding is that, yes, uh, the 1971, so this whole issue of Taiwan has been resolved, right? The PRC uh, uh, replaced the ROC as the sole representative of, of China, and Taiwan is part of China, right? That's, that's the position of PRC. But increasingly, I think, in Taiwan and also in the United States nowadays, increasingly some people are arguing that, look, you know, uh, Resolution 2758 only talked about the representation of China, which is uh, represented by the PRC now, but it does not clearly, directly talk about representation of Taiwan. Uh, well, that's a, that's a growing debate, I think, uh, now in Taiwan and in the United States. So I wonder, well, Dr. Lei, what is your take on this? Do you think that, uh, the Taiwan's, uh, uh, you know, future of Taiwan or Taiwan's uh, representation has been resolved uh, by this uh, resolution? Or uh, this is an open issue and uh, Taiwan can make a strong case to join the United Nations? I know there are a lot, but I have a lot more, but I have to stop here. I'll give <laughs> time for others to ask. Thank you so much, Dr. Lei. Okay. Wonderful presentation, thank you. Well, let me try to um, go back from your last question. Resolution 2758, we all understand that it was a very determining resolution that changed the full representation of China from Taiwan, the Republic of China to PRC, for those who did not know. Mm. So what, the Taiwan independence movement has always claimed that it does not apply to Taiwan. So if we were to have a referendum, have new constitution, then we can self-determine and then rejoin the United Nations. So that was the overall threat of the Taiwan independence proposal. Right now, the United States is echoing this proposal in a very close fashion. That will definitely be viewed by PRC as a support of Taiwan independence. When I gave you the three different proposals in terms of PRC's view on Taiwan China policy and a principle and United States one China policy and Taiwan's one China, one Taiwan. For those who did not know the history that the Taiwan perspective was not always that. Taiwan was under the KMT government was for a long time claimed it was the legal and lawful representation of that one China. So under the KMT previous regime, it was claimed that Taiwan was part of that one China and did not have the current position supported by the United States proclaimed by the DPP government. So there are changes within Taiwan's political arena and that probably will give you some of the sense on why the discussions and the languages even though it's the same language, but it changed its meaning. The semantic understanding changed over time. So now the most important question that I get asked all the time is, okay, you talk about the military operation unprecedented in 60 years. You know, all of a sudden around Taiwan, isn't Taiwan really dangerous? People were asking, you know, why don't you leave Taiwan? All my friends who were offered flight tickets to the United States or to Australia, to other places. But in Taiwan, if you go to the streets, people eat, drink, marry, do the same thing as, as ever. And from, from anecdotal interviews, you can see three different types of reactions. The first type, or probably the largest, is those who are against the current DPP government, which has a forefront of democratic and free, in fact, it has deprived a lot of the rights of the people and have oppressed a lot of the opposition, including taking full control over the media. Those are the things that the United States ignored. It turned a blind eye to when they touted Tsai Ing-wen as the uh, important ally of our American value in democracy and freedom. It intentionally ignored the suffering and cry for help by the local people oppressed by the current DPP government and or deprived of economic rights by their corruption. So a lot of people have reached the position that, okay, 
I can't fight you, DPP. And I can't really count on KMT, the Pan Blue Camp, to fight you because they didn't seem to be fighting. So maybe communists can come and really change the status quo, can fight DPP. Communists may be able to defeat DPP. That was something that nobody talked about. Almost no one recognized outside of Taiwan. So that's one, one part. The second part is very traditional, very much like uh, before Hong Kong returned in 1997, people were saying, okay, let me just wait and see. I'll see whether it will change my life. If worse come to worse, I'll buy my ticket and leave. So that was the second part. So, so you know, there will be a long period of time leading to whatever the eventuality is. But for now, I'm going to just wait and see. Then there is a third part that was actually vying, positioning themselves to be the future negotiators. And many of them are actually from the Pan Green camp. There were Pan Green camp who disagree with the extreme Taiwan independent fraction, and they are vying for the future negotiation and they're vying for that position. So all of them have a wait and see attitude, but their motives and the intended results are quite different. So that's the second part. Um, your third and fourth question, I was actually trying to find my numbers because I actually had a very large um, <clears throat> simulation in terms of numbers. Unfortunately, I couldn't quickly find it. But for the ones who are trying to figure out what Taiwan should and ought to do, there was a solution. If Taiwan continues to move on to the independence path, which will be determined in 2024 presidential election, Lai Qingde, who is trying to be the presidential candidate for the DPP, is a devout Taiwan independence quote unquote worker. So if he should win, then there will be no turning back of a potential peaceful resolution because the white paper, the third white paper had two preconditions in terms of the future. It did stipulate that if you were to go into independence and there were no room for peaceful solution, it will be a forced resolution. Mm -hmm. So independence leads only to forced resolution. If you are not in the independence, you can be sort of in the middle, you don't have a position and so on and so forth, then they need to remove the two obstacles of that peaceful resolution. One is Taiwan independence claim, two is foreign direct intervention. So those are the two factors I mentioned briefly today. One is the Taiwan independence, the other was the US direct intervention. What worries me the most is the, um, the posturing. The military posturing is one thing, but the increasing military participation <coughs> and involvement in Taiwan, um, as we are seeing in recent years, will at one point be interpreted as a direct intervention of cross-strait relations. That will be in violation of um, United States long-term position, but also it will be a direct threat to the Beijing government. Just think about Cuba. You know, I, I see that discussion in a lot of US strategists. They say they want the mini Cuba so that they can shake the status quo. And then with the aftermath, reaching a new equilibrium, going back to a new normal in which US will gain dominance or supremacy. And if that were the case, they may imagine a limited war, but the limited war will be paid by people on the first chain, mm -hmm. by the countries and the people of the first chain. And let me just add one thing. Current um, arms procurement does not provide Taiwan it, with a full sort of defense mechanism. All of them are asymmetrical warfare weapons. And these asymmetrical warfare weapons are also very archaic. It's not on the more recent ones. It's using human beings as the sure. weapons. And it will go into cities, countries, mountains. And Taiwan is an extremely small island, has no chance of winning. Any leader bringing his or her country into war must have an idea of what's the post-war order you know, what you, you try to achieve after the war. And for the Taiwan case, 
if you go into a war, however limited, or well, actually there is no limited war in Taiwan for Taiwan is very small. <clears throat> there, there is no, there is no win to be expected at the other end. It has only a length, a duration game. You know how long you can prolong this game, and then for international intervention, for international, um, including UN to wage any kind of sanction against PRC and so on and so forth. There was no scenario in which Taiwan could win this war with however large sacrifice there may be. So as a leader, I think it's important for you as a leader not to go into that path because there is no win, simply as that. Yes, thank you very much. Um... I'm going to ask my friend uh, Larry Chasman to ask a question, which I think is uh, pretty much reflects many of the American intellectual elites uh, who believes in uh, democracy. Uh, wanted to ask this question, Larry, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And it can was you, a can great we see pleasure. your face and also tell people who you are? Okay, I don't have my camera on, but I am a professor at the University of Texas, and I know Dr. Swain many years, and we have good discussions about these kind of things. My question is, it's a great presentation of history and everything that goes back. I had no idea of all that, but it, it comes to today where we are, and why doesn't China just let uh, Taiwan make their own decisions about what they want to do? I think that was something that was we thought was going to happen, and there's no rush one way or the other, but why doesn't China just say Taiwan gets to decide their future, like a lot of the countries in the world get to decide their future? Um, I tried to address that a little earlier, that in the past, when the government in Taiwan, which was the Republic of China, also claimed to be a part, to have the one China constitution, the that one China, the government in Taiwan, Republic of China was founded in 1911 in China. It has a very long history of regarding itself as the legitimate and lawful representation of the entire China. It is when the new DPP government gained power. It did not change the name of Taiwan it still used the name of, P of Republic of China as the official name. It keeps its constitution, which has the entire China as its territory and recognizing that the administrative power is limited to only Taiwan and its related islands. So I think it's easy and simple to say, oh, Taiwan is Taiwan and China is China. But at one point, the government in Taiwan, the Republic of China, also claim the entirety of China. So I, I think to let Taiwan decide on itself will fall into this one Taiwan, one China trap. And that will be a very difficult situation to avoid future confrontation. But I don't think, no one thinks that Taiwan would try to say they're the only China. I mean, there's a, you know, China is huge. So I, I think we need to look at today's what's going on and not go back to 1911 and try to make some points about Taiwan is the only China. I think that is not true. Just look at today and the world's going pretty good. Why not keep the status quo and we don't have to go back and dig up 1911 history. Well, I respect your perspective, but I think it is also important to know that not everyone on Taiwan agree with the current government and not everyone agree, even within the DPP, not everyone agree with the extreme Taiwan independent promoters. And the United States have touted these extreme Taiwan independent promoters, ignoring the historical backgrounds, much like you know, it has treated other countries and places. So, you know, I respect your perspective, but I think there are more complex issues. And if you look at the people around Taiwan, there are representation of different walks. People have different affinity. Some are extremely close to Japan and others have different affinities. 
So you're right. People should decide for themselves. Um, okay, Joanne. That's a good, that's a very, hello, who's that? You go ahead. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Stephen. Yeah, I think Joanne, with all your media background, let me ask the Yifan Chen to ask the next question. My old friend, I haven't seen him for a long time. Yeah, Joanne, <laughs> how are you? How are I, you? I, have, no, I, I haven't Joanne. either, I have not either. Oh yeah, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I, I have a simple question because in your background, I know you will uh, provide a very good answer. Uh, I always enjoy your, your Zoom talks and uh, the Taiwan's uh, so-called so these uh, elite talks, okay? That actually keeps a lot of uh, Chinese overseas people sort of uh, uh, alive a little bit about Taiwan. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody pays attention to Taiwan media anymore. With your media background, okay? Uh, I view the situation as this. The so-called confrontation, of course, ultimately the military war is, is when you say to war or not to war, you are implying military war. But before that, uh, there is of course economic war, there's a diplomatic war, and there's the media war. In fact, in my opinion, uh, in the modern days, after uh, post World War II, media war actually plays a lot of role in determining the future. Unfortunately, uh, it was lopsided for a long, long time, okay? Uh, China hasn't been in the media sort of uh, uh, as, as strong as the United States uh, dominating the world opinion. And this is a disadvantage in preventing war, okay? As well as is a uh, you know, advantage for promoting war. And as you can see, uh, the Ukraine war and all this, the United States certainly has all the advantage at this point. So with your background, okay, predicting in the future, I think China has realized the media is important and there is change of policy. As you can see, the CGTN is gaining quite a bit of recognition in the world. That was never happened uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, I hope, okay, the problem we face is the, the elite, uh, elite people that uh, in the world are uh, seeing sort of uh, the world through their media, their information channels is so different from the common folks, which now are rising up, call it the left or right, whatever you call them. They are really simplistic and sometimes being manipulated. As you can see now, you, Europe have so many demonstrations and these people, how do we really uh, utilize media to make the people really as a democratic force to make the government, make the world go to peace? Okay, it's a long question. I'm sure you're gonna have a good answer. Well, thank you, Yifei. Um, you reminded me of my days at ABC when we looked at the world from a New York US centric perspective. But also at that time, the media has a very strong self-discipline in terms of reporting the news, checking our own perspective and our predispositions. Right now, you have a time of very fragmented media scene. All of them seem to be very strong in positions they take, including in the United States. And let me just add one thing. I think the war on China is ongoing and has already started. It, just like you said, it has different perspectives. I have not seen a US media, especially in entertainment, be so hostile toward any country, even to Japan or Germany, it was not to the extent, perhaps only to the Nazi German because you have a very strong sort of um, Holocaust cost background. Um, you need to have alternatives. The problem is the alternative only goes to self-selected audience. So our world doesn't have a shared zeitgeist. People don't have a shared mindset, mindset a shared knowledge of realities to engage in real discussions. We are all self-selecting on things we see, things we remember, and things we discuss about. So that world is a very dangerous world. We saw the beginning of that in 1992 in my first 
thesis written for ABC, because we're seeing the breaking down of commonality, of zeitgeist, of uh, understanding in a shared view. For instance, if you're in the United States, you remember when Kennedy was shot and you remember the Cuban crisis and that became a framework of joint discussions. But now you don't have events that's reaching all the millions of people all at once and building the same understanding and I, I, ideology understanding at the same time. So we are in an impasse. For example, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting, the summit I alluded to earlier. If you watch carefully, you will see all these Central Asia countries' economies thriving and going back to their long and you know, extremely strong history with pride. And China is leaders going there, giving them a voice because they brought 500 international medium, media to that location and give them a voice that they didn't have before. So it is important for the strong and the center to share its ability and its network to the weak and the peripheral. We are not seeing that from my, my old history you mentioned. When I was in New York, um, 1987 to 96, I was really, really proud of the things we do and the attempt we try to bring equality and fair play to the world and even social justice. But I can't say the thing, same thing about US media anymore, let alone other media. So you brought up another important point that is China seems to be learning from its past mistake CGTN with its many languages, you know, it has Indian, it has other languages, is trying to be the gateway for the people who have no voice, for the places that were not in the center previously. And hopefully this alternative network will gradually bring in a new zeitgeist, new understanding, new general commonality for us human beings to move forward. You know, I know people, perhaps challenging me for being too optimistic. I'm not optimistic, I'm really pessimistic. I think we have huge troubles in the world and we can't even resolve these problems if we work together, let alone if we don't work together and start killing each other. So my proposal and my strong proposition for peace is based on a fear that we are in a really, really big turning point. The world is destroying itself and we must work together. Thanks, Ife. Good to see okay. you. All right, yes. We're coming to close to the end. And uh, as someone who has spent the last three years, uh, actually last five years, working on the Belt and Road Initiative, I think there's an interesting question here from uh, a gentleman called Gary Guan. Um, I'll just read what he has said. I see Belt and Road Initiative is one of the biggest strategic failure of the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, uh, particularly Xi. It created its own competitors for China now when all the supply chain reshuffling in the current situation compounded by COVID-19 and the recent China policies. Uh, so your, your optimistic suggestion at the end that that the Belt and Road Initiative, what you call OBOR, One Belt, One Road, um, is, a, is a solution to the current situation. Could you comment on that? Well, if we see the world as a static pole, the pole as a static pole, then the stronger your competitors are, the weaker you will be, which was the zero sum era. But through internet, we understand that we have the ability to expand the pool. It is possible to increase and enlarge the economic pie. Think about the Build and Road Initiative. Once it connected all these uh, inland hinterland communities, Kazakhstan and so on and so forth, and allowed them to build economies for themselves and then linking them back to a very large market, which is China, 
then it not only will have the ability to supply goods for its own people, but also have the ability to trade with Europe and China on both ends. So if you look at um, Adam Smith, he truly believed that once we started trading, we can add values with the trade. In your idea or in your example of supply chain, you know, the ones who are making, I don't know, a garment, when it trades, it helps the cotton makers, the build, cotton growers, the manufacturers, and then it goes into the department stores, it goes into the shipping companies. It, it has a lot of chain effects that will build economic activities for the communities along the way. So I use that one particular chart to demonstrate that it's not just linking together, but building local, regional, and larger global economic relationship. And that to me is a great proposal. Even if it doesn't achieve its goal 100%, it has already changed the old power relations. Remember what the old power relationship was when I was growing up as a sociology student and political, uh, political science students. It is about the North and the South. The South is being deprived of its due value and the North is the industrial nations that enjoy all the benefits of the toy and labor of the South. So once you change that, you linked people and built networks and webs, just like when we go into internet, internet commonized and also equalized information. Information used to be where you can make money and the ones who can dominate information will have dominant power and welfare and wealth. Now, once you can commonize linkage, connection, infrastructure, when we go into the new world, you, you need new electric cars. Those hinterland countries, don't need all diesel engine cars. They can go directly into electric cars. They have an ability to go directly into the new world, which is not only good for themselves, but also good for the world. We just need to open up our imagination and think about how that sharing and the development of technology and implementation of new solutions can bring to well-being and welfare of people of all and not just people of few. That was my two cents. Thank you. Well, it's more than two cents there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that uh, we have, uh, unfortunately, uh, our time is up. Um, there are so many questions uh, that people have asked. Your talks clearly have stimulated people asking questions that they may not have thought of before, uh, which is probably the reason why we have such talks. It's just to open up new dimensions of thinking. Thank you very much, uh, uh, my, my friend, uh, Joanne. I want to also thank Stephen and also <clears throat> Professor Tu for your uh, active and in-depth participation today. Uh, we will be sending out to the world the recordings today via uh, YouTube. Uh, thank you very much again. Good night or good morning as the case may be. Good bye night. bye. And uh, Stephen. Good night. Hi. <laughs> bye bye. Good night. Hey, Dashen. Hi. Bye bye. bye.